Uh, so announcements, the first discussion is tomorrow. Uh, make sure you know what time your section is. Show up, be ready to go. If you have your own laptop, you might want to bring it. I mean, there's CAE, it's, there's CAE computers in the labs, um, but you might benefit from having your own laptop because you'll be using it for homework, so, um, so do that. First homework will be posted this Friday uh, in two days, and then it'll be due the following Friday, okay? Uh, so today we'll talk about relation to uh, relation of heat transfer to thermo and then modes of heat transfer. Okay, so relation to thermodynamics. Um, so you all have taken or are taking thermodynamics. I think probably all have taken thermodynamics. So what does thermo tell you, right, about a problem involving energy? Uh, well, thermodynamics will tell you, you know, you've got some heat, you've got some work, you've got things going in, in and out of a control volume. It helps you relate all those things to each other, right? You're, you're able to kind of uh, develop relationships, say, between a, a temperature and a state, like enthalpy or entropy. Uh, you're able to relate work to temperature, right? All those things. What does thermodynamics not tell you, especially when it relates to heat transfer, right? Well, thermodynamics doesn't tell you the mode of heat transfer. It doesn't help you predict the temperature of the system, like within, uh, within a continuum. It doesn't, tell you, it doesn't help you relate the temperature to a rate of heat transfer, right? So in this class, we're, we're thinking entirely about how heat moves and then how temperature profiles in, a, in some body or between surfaces, how that relates to heat movement, okay? So here we've got our, our thermodynamics control volume. Um, so let's kind of take inventory of all the stuff that, that normally you get. So you, uh, here this, we have this uh, shaft that's doing work. So you have some rate of work on the shaft and our control volume. Um, you maybe have some heat loss, so we'll call that Q dot, uh, Q dot out in this case. Uh, maybe you have some heat addition down here, that's Q dot in. Um, what else could we have? So I've got these little ports drawn. I mean, that's an indication that you maybe have stuff flowing in or leaving. So here we have uh, m dot in, and then leaving we have m dot out. So this being a energy balance, mass flow is not that helpful. So we need to multiply that by enthalpy. So I in, m dot I out. Um, so you may, I don't know, in, in your thermal you may have used H for enthalpy. Uh, in this class we force ourselves to use I because H is used for heat transfer coefficients. Okay, so we have that all so far. What else, uh, what else do we need? So you could have some change uh, du dt, right? Some change of internal energy with respect to time. Um, you might also have like conversion of thermal energy. So we'll call that generation, which is G dot. So all this stuff is like what you're used to dealing with with a thermodynamic control volume. Um, so we're gonna do a lot of the same type of control volume analysis in this class, except we stop drawing the control volume around the entire system and we pick a differential element and we start re developing relationships that way. Okay, so the, let's just kind of state the first law. Okay, so the first law of thermo, I should say first law of thermodynamics, um, is that in a closed system, energy balances. Energy balances. Okay, if you ever can't read my handwriting, just wait, flag me down. I'll try, but uh, you may need some clarification. Okay, so for this, I mean, we can kind of group stuff together. We say there's stuff going in, there's stuff leaving, there's stuff being generated or converted, there's stuff being stored, right? And so that we would say it's maybe E is our general term for energy. So E in is positive, E out is negative, right? Energy in minus energy out. Uh, anything that's converted or genera uh, generated would be positive, E gen. Anything that's stored is negative, E stored. All that is equal to some change 
delta u, and internal energy. All right, so it's maybe a different nomenclature than you used before, but this is the idea, right? This is the, the first law. Um, did I lose my mic? No, still good? Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so this is, this is true for some period of time. So this is for, uh, for some delta t duration, right? some number of seconds. So when we're talking about uh, like a, a moment in time, a rate, uh, this all is ba basically the same, but we just rewrite it in terms of rates. So we'd say e dot in minus e dot out plus e dot gen minus e dot stored is equal to uh, not delta u anymore, but it's some change in internal energy with time. So that's what we wrote on the control volume, which is uh, du dt. Okay. So this first law uh, relationship helps us develop an ordinary differential equation with respect to time, right? du dt. Um, so this is, again, instantaneous for some moment, right? Some moment in time. You can pick one of those little buckets of energy. We can pick like E dot N, and then we, we uh, have specific things that go with that, uh, that particular term. So for example, here, let's pick E dot N. So in this case, what, is, what are all the energy sources that are coming in? Well, that would be enthalpy, M dot N, I N. It also would be uh, Q dot N, right? Q dot N. So when we're talking about doing the energy balance and, and what we're going to use moving forward, you see this E dot stuff kind of once, right? And then, and then after this point, we really talk in terms of the specific modes, the specific uh, components, the Q dots, the enthalpies, and so on. Um, so this is kind of the, the relationship to, to first law. Again, this tells you energy balance. It doesn't tell you at all how to predict temperature. It doesn't say like, okay, I know this is a certain temperature. I know there's the surroundings that are another temperature. Here's my rate Q dot N. This doesn't give you any of that information. Um, so again, that's what we're going to be doing in this class. Okay, so uh, let's think a little bit about um, this relationship to thermodynamics from a second law perspective. So forgive my graphic, we'll get to that in a second. So the second law of thermo, um, so think for yourself kind of what that is again. The second law of thermodynamics uh, is basically uh, a statement. There's all these different ways that you can state it, but it's the basic idea is that heat will move spontaneously from a hot reservoir to a cold reservoir. Right, so we could write that out. So heat flows uh, from hot to cold reservoirs. Okay, this is sometimes uh, stated this way, and this is the Clausius, uh, the Clausius statement of the second law. Um, so that's great. I mean, you, it makes sense that heat flows from hot to cold. I mean, it's intuitive for us because we experience that. Um, what it kind of, the, the subtlety or the important thing here is that that word spontaneously, right? This word here. So without doing any work, right? This is no work required. Without doing any work, heat will flow. Um, all of this kind of gets to this idea of uh, thermodynamic irreversibility, right? So this gets to the idea of irreversibility. Uh, and why am I talking about irreversibility? Well, do you remember the conditions that lead to irreversibility, right, from thermodynamics? So if you are doing work, and that work that you're doing is less than 100% efficient, it is, it's not reversible, that process generates heat, right? If you're generating heat in any process that's imperfect, which by the way is literally every process, right? Everything that, that you do, every process, if you're doing something, 
is going to generate heat in some form. Okay? If, if that's the case, then you need to, in that particular process, keep track of that heat and deal with it in some way. So as engineers, you know, we're in the business of doing things, which is uh, good, right? You're trying to accomplish things. You're not just leaving things uh, to sit and become stagnant. So we're doing things. That means anything that you do uh, is going to have irreversibility. It's going to have heat generation. It may or may not be important or significant, but you at least need to know what it's going to be and how to deal with it if, if it is important. So just some examples of this. You've got, I mean, you're all sitting here. Uh, you're convecting, evaporating, radiating, uh, conducting to the floor, to your chair, whatever. So just by existing, you are a heat transfer problem. Um, let's make it a little slightly less creepy to look at. So we'll flip this to, there, OK. It doesn't look so ominous. Um, some other examples. So down in the corner, you've got this, uh, maybe you're interested in electric machines, right? So an electric machine, you can do this thermograph uh, and see if there's a problem. So in this particular uh, generator, there's one spot uh, near where the shaft is that's white hot, all right? So you're just looking at this, it's sitting there, it's spinning away, everything's fine. Uh, this thing is about to fail, right? There's about to be a catastrophic bearing failure on this device. Um, and how do you know that? Well, it's hot. There's a lot of irreversibility. There's a huge amount of heat generation that's occurring because the process is extremely inefficient because a bearing is broken or somebody forgot to put um, oil on it or something like that, right? So there's a relationship, a direct relationship between the heat in a problem or in this particular situation and uh, all the other aspects of engineering that you've spent a lot of time dealing with. Okay, so example, another example, you could, again, IR cameras, I guess I like those. Uh, so this is an IR camera of a, a house. So this is like a big, big business. People go around, take IR images of your house and tell you how bad your uh, construction company was at making sure your house is insulated. So like in this case, they, they didn't bother insulating the third level. So I guess in the neighbor's house is pretty crappy too. You can pick up on that. Uh, another example, you know, bad thermal management, not to dump on Tesla, but um, you know, if, if you're not careful about thermal management of a battery, for example, it can get out of hand, right? And this particular Tesla caught fire twice. <laughs> okay, so just examples. I think it, it's, I'm trying to kind of ground you in why this stuff is important. Um, questions on this? Okay. So as, as engineers, you understand heat transfer, you want to get to a point where you're not uh, kind of overlooking the importance of thermal management. So it could be electronics, it could be energy storage, it could be uh, you know, avionics, it could be aerospace, whatever it is, like thermal management is extremely important. 